So hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Narani Nimpuno and I'm the Head of Global Engagement at the London Internet Exchange, LINX. And I'll be your moderator for today's session, how to build an agile network for financial services and enhance customer experience. And I'm joined today by our great industry experts, Halil Kama, Peering Advisor for LINX, Patrick uh, Lastane, Director of Business Development at Interaction, and Matthew Lampriere, Head of UK, Middle East and APAC Sales at BSO. And if you have any questions at all for our panel during the session, please use the Q&A um, function and I'll pick them up and put them to our expert panelists. So we are seeing an increased online demand and traffic volumes for financial services. And with the fast adoption of cloud, AI, blockchain and real-time collaboration tools, how do networks keep their data and infrastructure secure, reliable and agile? whilst performing at a high level. So those are the uh, questions that we will be covering today. And this process of moving to a more agile approach when it comes to networking is often part of an organization's digital transformation. So let's jump straight to it and look at what digital transformation is. So can I turn to you, Matthew? What do we actually mean when we talk about digital transformation and agile networking? Hi, thank you. So. Yes, I think most people understand the concept of um, digital transformation, but it's essentially embedding digital technology across all areas of your business to enhance your uh, customer experience, um, amongst other things. And um, of course, what that does, well, as, you, as you embed this new technology, the amount of data that you um, produce, store, ship around the world increases quite dramatically. Um, Therefore, the amount of compute power that you have needs to increase. Um, and that's why a lot of people are looking at deploying into the cloud. Um, it allows them the flexibility um, and the, the expansion that, that they need for that. And then, of course, you then look at your networks and you have to look at these hugely increasing amounts of data that you're shipping around. And that data needs to be shipped safely, securely, um, and in a very high quality and high performance way. Um, I think if you look just now, we're all on Zoom. Um, people have been working on Zoom for at least the last year or so, um, and, and obviously other online um, video services. And again, that's a great example of the uh, huge increase in traffic volumes that have uh, occurred over the last year. So um, to, to, to really deliver proper digital transformation, you need to have flexible compute power. You need to have flexible um, network power and it needs to be high performance and, and high quality and none of those parts can be missed at any any stage during this process and I, I like to use car examples if you're building a formula one car you need all of your um, your different components to be the best quality available there's no point in building a car and then putting rubbish tires on it so you you have to have all of your different sections thought out of and, and some people miss some of these areas you'd be surprised how many digital transformation plans that you look at and people have forgotten network for example or you know can't just shove it on the internet without thinking about these things you really have to plan them and that's where um, I think we're going to be talking today yeah thank you for that that's so true and I think this shift what you're describing from on-premise IT systems to this more platform-based models with applications and data in the cloud I think it's something we see that is true for many organizations, both outside and, and inside the financial industry. So if we hone in on that, uh, the, the financial services industry a little bit more. So London is one of the global financial hubs in the world, but it's also one of the main interconnection hubs in terms of internet networking in the world. So what does that actually mean for financial services firms and their ability to adopt agile networking? Uh, Patrick, could I turn to you to talk to that a bit? Sure, thank you, Nurani, and hello, everyone. Um, in, indeed, just, just building on the point um, made by Matthew and uh, equating sort of digital transformation with the data challenge, I think that's where uh, I think London and financial services stands out, uh, really. So 
over here at Interaction Digital Realty, what we have done in the past couple of years, we've tried to sort of quantify this um, challenge attached to, to data and digital transformation. And uh, we've come up with a, the concept called the, the Data Gravity Index. So I think everyone understands that, you know, when you undertake your data, your digital transformation, you face those data challenges. Um, and, and so we've, we've designed this index, which basically is, is a function of, you know, data mass, uh, the activity of the data, the bandwidth associated with a particular location like London, and, and also the latency, the average latency between a location and all the other locations. And, and when we give, and all this is measured in gigabit per second, um, and, and if we look globally, uh, all the, the metro, metro areas, London is the one with the highest data gravity challenge. And if you look at the sectors, financial services is the one with the highest data gravity challenge. So I think, you know, irrespective of um, uh, uh, the sort of uh, geopolitical Brexit and all these sort of things, if you just look at the, at the sheer data volumes uh, that uh, financial services firms need to uh, need to uh, cope with, uh, you know, it's, it's a tremendous challenge and hence the need for agile networking uh, technology. Yeah, wonderfully captured there. Thanks. Halil, do you want to add anything given that Lynx runs one of the large internet hubs in the world in London? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, London is a, a vital part of our peering ecosystem, um, not only for the telco world and digital networks that also connect to Lynx itself, but um, also it's a, a great benefit to the fintech community and the finance world that is, is located within um, the UK and Europe, essentially, um, because you have all kinds of networks from all around the world trying to reach London, right? Uh, we have 84 countries connected into links at the moment. Um, so that shows the level of interest um, within the ecosystem that we've created uh, in London. And people are going far and wide from across the world to reach that. And the, the finance companies that are located in London have that on their doorstep to connect to. Now, obviously, first, it began within the telco world, but the telco world was, was taking advantage of this. Um, but as now everything um, has more of a, a data usage point to it and everything is going across the internet, um, this has become more and more vital um, for finance networks. So they're able to capitalize on that um, within the ecosystem they currently sit in. Um, so it's, it's a great crossover um, on all points, really. Um, and we're still in a great place of being able to um, have great startups in, in the country and uh, push that digital economy forward. I mean, just in terms of startups, there are over 30 UK uh, FinTech startups or finance startups, however you want to label it, that have over hundred million pounds in investment um, as of January this year. Um, so that's, it's a great position to be in. And that will only further enhan enhance London's position um, with the ecosystem of FinTech as well as digital connectivity, which we're all a part of. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. And so clearly there are a lot of good factors that come together um, in, in London and, and conditions are right for, for uh, this digital transformation to happen. And of course, many digital services firms have already embarked on that journey. Um, but before we, we go on to sort of the, the solution space, can we talk a little bit about what challenges these financial services firms Face as they embark on that digital transformation, as they move towards more agile networking and they try to take control over the network. Um, Matthew, could I turn to you to start off with that? Yeah, sure. I mean, it challenges or opportunities, whichever way you look at it. I like to think of them as, as opportunities. But um, yeah, I mean, it, I was reading a report earlier this week that IBM had put out with Ernst & Young around a... Um, a new team they've created, or a new business they've created to help the banks uh, move to the cloud. And um, you've just got to look at the actual, the, the, the size of this challenge for them, you know, moving all of their back office systems um, into the cloud. Uh, it's it, one or two, you know, mobile banking apps and things like that is relatively straightforward. But when you're looking at some of these massive back office systems, I mean, the challenge is, um, is extreme, to be honest with you. Um, then you look at some of the other, uh, where I say opportunities, you know, uh, digitizing systems and replacing old systems with maybe blockchain based ones. 
that the Australian Stock Exchange are doing with their chess system. Um, you're looking at ways people can improve the services they offer out to clients by having better mobile apps, um, better uh, trading applications. I think trading is a, is a great example for this where um, firms can look at new, new liquidity, um, getting into the world of digital assets and, and crypto. Um, there's just, it, the, the list is endless, really. I mean, I could, I could spend the next week talking about them and probably still have missed a few. But um, I think, that, I think it, the, the main things they have to cover, um, make sure it's uh, all regulatory approved, make sure it's all um, sound, make sure it's secure, make sure it's safe, and make sure you can get your data in and out of wherever you put it in a safe, secure, and uh, high-performance manner. But the regulatory approval is so critical for this. And actually, just to give one more, I know we haven't got a huge amount of time, but another quick example, I was talking to someone recently in Hong Kong. I won't say which bank, but they were running the compliance team for Asia and literally looking across all of the bank systems from HR through to mobile banks and electronic trading, looking at which application could or could not go into a cloud because of uh, data sovereignty and other rules. So this is I mean, it's a massive, massive area and a very exciting area because it does improve the customer experience. And that is what, that's what this is all about. Yeah, thank you. I, I like that uh, that uh, take on it. Of course, you know when that when there's opportunity for change and that challenges, that also means that there are huge opportunities to to uh, to get ahead of the game, so to speak. Patrick, do you want to add to that? Sure. So I I think the um, the challenge as as Matthew uh, outlines is is really you you have on one hand and I think within financial services the wave is coming now or it is we right in the middle of it cloud migration you know it's it's really taking off uh, I think most major banks uh, incumbent have decided at a very senior level to be cloud first um, so all of a sudden you have um, app development and you've got tremendous activity on the DevOps front and um, building of new applications on, on the cloud. But, uh, so you have this DevOps world, which is very active uh, and really driving the requirement for the infrastructure team, I would have called the NetOps. And the challenge really is those two worlds need to bridge and cohabitate. And all of a sudden, if you're a network architect, you need to start accommodating uh, you know, this growth of, of new applications. So how do you architect this? How do you forecast traffic patterns which you've never seen before? Uh, and, and how do you forecast what type of application is going to end up in the cloud? So there's a complete shift in, in the way that uh, people think. And we've seen that transition at the data center level. Whereas in the past, you know, you used to architect hub and spoke with your main on-prem data center and connecting to you know, external parties and one or two clouds. Now, really, it's it's you treat your on-prem data center just as another satellite, you know, as, as a cloud, and instead all the traffic occurs cloud to cloud, and really in proximity to the on and off ramp. So uh, we can see that you know it's difficult for for these financial services enterprises because it's very um, buoyant, you know, it's, it's very active on the app, app development front, but on the other hand, the the transition rationalize your and rewind your network takes time. So I think that's that's really uh, one of the challenges is how do you how do you change whilst you know the, the need for innovation and and, uh, and 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 new app development is is constant. Yeah, thank you for that. Halil, do you have anything uh, to add from a, a in interconnection hub perspective? Because I think you see a lot of similar things as well. Absolutely. Um, to add to Patrick's point of the data center world, obviously being able to do this um, for several years already in terms of predicting um, the, the traffic growth and scaling for that. Um, it, it's something we've done in, in the telco world, and I think the telco world has, has been the, the leader in scalability in terms of capacity for that uh, as an industry. Um, obviously, we've had to service all of the requirements that, that are needed, especially over the last year. Um, so packets haven't been dropped and, and people have still been able to reach whatever website that they want to view or whatever service application they're trying to use. Um, and that's all, all essentially done across uh, data centers and uh, the backhaul providers and uh, many other partners that we utilize. 
Um, but there is a shift now and a transition and a much more forward thinking cap, uh, I, I'd say, um, in the finance and enterprise world that has come to light um, in the last 12 to 18 months, for sure, because they have realized the importance of data and the control of data. Um, so essentially, if you're handing it to a third party provider, you don't control that as well as you would like to do. Um, and especially when it comes to higher bandwidth being consumed, whether it's in an office environment, you're trying to reach Office 365 or a large cloud provider, or you're just using Zoom at home to, to uh, do a conference call across the, uh, the business's VPN. That all requires a certain higher level of connectivity that wasn't there before. So now that's prompted a shift in uh, a shift in, in thought process of how they're going to acquire these services and what they're going to do to make it agile, to make it cost effective for the business, and also to, to give a better user experience, as Patrick has, has um, pointed out. And um, that's what it, it's, it's all about, right? Giving a better user experience for everyone that uses the, the service essentially at a more cost effective rate because everyone wants higher levels of, of data at a lower cost rate. Um, so that's what uh, networks are continuing to face to the challenge within the telco world. But now this has gone to a broader horizon of the fintech and enterprise worlds as well, which is interesting to see from our perspective. Yes, indeed. I think it, it's interesting also, I think, as you've all noted that, you know, I think that the pandemic is also uh, with everyone being work, working from home and everyone um, having to find uh, online solutions, so to speak, if there was any doubt at all before that there was a need for this digital transformation, I think that is completely gone now. I think everyone, uh, both individuals, but also certainly organizations understand this need to, to have resilient um, online and, and available services that you can reach from many different places. Um, so I know, you know, the, the data centers, internet exchange points and transport networks, they're key components in the internet. Uh, and they all sit at the core of the internet. Um, and I know that you have all noticed this huge shift, particularly in the last year, but, but I think many of us noticed this shift even before that. Um, and your organizations also play a key role in enabling this transformation towards hybrid IT, agile networking, and, uh, and enabling customers to take control over their network infrastructure. Um, if we could do another, if I could go around the room and, and if you could talk a little bit about what parts your organizations play, and if you have examples as well of um, uh, customers that you have or uh, scenarios that you you've uh, experienced um, in in um, in this agile networking and digital transformation um, Patrick maybe I can start with you sure um, so so I think where we are positioned effectively we our role is is to enable um, the likes of, of links and BSO to to be able to be as agile as possible when they del deliver, you know, and and connectivity um, solutions for for their customers. So um, we are now within the group. If you look at London, if you look, you know, you got you got obviously the interaction. There's a sort of classic interaction, legacy interaction set of data centers, and we also had what what is digital realty. Um, so it is various. It's a very varied. Um, and all encompassing type of data centers. We've got co-location, we've got scale, we've got location in the city, in the Docklands and outside. And I think the uh, the intuitive uh, for us is was to really interconnect all of these data centers uh, to ensure that, you know, no matter who you are, when you when you come with, uh, you know, one of our data centers, you have the right connectivity solution. So I think that's, and I think that fits really well with, with how financial services is evolving because you need low latency, you need uh, connectivity to certain suppliers, uh, but you also need scale for your for your data lakes and, and very data intensive applications. Uh, that's the first thing. The, the second thing we've, we've seen more and more is, is also, uh, I would say completely cloud native uh, type of FinTechs who are born in the cloud and uh, more and more realize that they need to start having some sort of uh, physical footprints in order to be completely compliant with um, some of the um, requirements, I would say, 
for instance, one, one, one example we did, we worked very closely with AWS to enable uh, cloud swift connectivity. So customers porting their payment applications into AWS, but then wanting to go all cloud, but then still needing to have hardware security modules located in co-location bundle with, with uh, you know, layer two connectivity and then connecting back to the Swift network. So this is a sort of um, uh, new firms that we deal with, the, the, the big FinTech, and obviously they want to do this in London and then uh, you know, scale all across the world with a similar solution. So more and more we're having to think about these very hybrid solution that enables hybrid IT, not just for the legacy, uh, or should we say incumbent uh, financial services player, but also for the, um, the really the, the new banks and the fintechs. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Halil, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it all reverts now back to um, what I, we've all been saying earlier, um, the ecosystem that, that we operate in um, within the, the telco world is very well known. And that ecosystem is is further expanding out um, in, in our viewpoint, especially at, at links, we get a great viewpoint of what's happening within the, the internet world as such with um, over 900 plus ASs or networks connected to us. So we, we get a great bird's eye view of that. And what we're seeing is that traditionally the telco world would connect a, a carrier or whoever they're looking to reach. They would just join an exchange at whatever part of the world, pass their traffic from A to B with low latency, um, manipulate that using BGP. So they're able to control the traffic as they wish and they're in control of their network, right? And it's a very cost-effective way of doing that. Um, the f finance and enterprise world has kind of shied away from uh, joining an ecosystem um, such as links or exchange where there, are, there is 900 plus networks connected to it. They think, oh, there may be a, a, a different security elements that they're not used to in a, in a normal uh, transit environment perhaps, but um, that all comes with um, educating um, the end network on, on peering. But um, they've realized that once they do peer, they're able to then have, let's say a particular service provider or a network they're looking to reach join the exchange as well and service that requirement straight across the exchange as opposed to having a cross connect to them and let's say 30 other networks that they also do business with so instead of having 30 cross connects they now have the single one they're doing that across the exchange they've lowered their latency they have much more control over their network and their cost saving all at the same point right um so that's what they've realized and they're now pushing each other within um, in the behind the scenes of the peering world, if you like, to say you should join an exchange because we could pass traffic to you at point A and B. Um, and the, the, they're kind of pointing their heads over the pit and saying, wow, we didn't know that before. Okay, we'll, we'll join. Um, and we're, we're seeing the larger players almost push the smaller providers into peering or the, the other way around, actually, the smaller providers are already there and they're saying, We've been at links for a long time. I'm sure we can reach you across the exchange, as an example. Um, so that's what we've noticed, um, particularly over the last year or so, as a trend that uh, is continuing to happen. And it will only further expand as the demand for internet increases. This is only going to increase um, because the, the, the supplier capacity is unlimited than the exchange. As many networks as you wish can join at the end of the day, you don't need an infinite amount of cross connect. So it's cost saving all around. Yeah, that's really interesting. This this thing about a few uh, few players spearheading the, the the change and breaking new ground, and then uh, showing others that that it's uh, actually possible. Absolutely. to have that great benefits there. Matthew, um, do you want to talk to that as well? I know that you also you've also seen uh, these these changes, and I know that you also talk very much about. Um, you know, it's about the, offering the best connectivity and flexible options, uh, not locking yourself into one particular solution. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, what BSO's raison d'etre is to is to get data around the world in a safe, secure um, manner. Um, so, if you have data in one part of the world and you need it somewhere else, um, we we are the people to talk to about that. And you you see that with everything from, as I said before, internal systems and. 0365 has been mentioned a couple of times. You know, if you have 0365 in the cloud, you probably have it in multiple instances around the world and you need your people working at home um, or in your office to get access to that data 
and you need to replicate that data and back it up all around the world. So um, that's where people like us um, come in. That's where BSO are, are, are very strong. Um, the other area that we see a big increase in data and traffic is the world of electronic trading, um, particularly high frequency trading where people see arbitrage opportunities um, around the world. That's traditionally been where, um, where we operate. So we, we have the lowest latency fiber and RF, which is microwave or millimeter wave um, networks um, in the world. And if I just give one example of that, if you look at the world of digital assets and cryptos, they, they have grown out of the cloud, as we were discussing earlier. They are cloud native businesses, most of them. Um, and uh, they are now looking at how can you get uh, arbitrage opportunities between the different exchanges. And so actually the, the need for low latency networks is becoming extremely prevalent in the digital assets world. And I've noticed one of the questions that's come in on the chat is around data sovereignty. Um, one of the challenges with, with using cloud has been how do you prove where your data is stored? So we actually offer a service where you can store your data with us um, in data centers around the world. So we have an ST storage um, product that is in various data centers. So if you're trading cryptos, but you actually want to store your data in that country so you can prove data sovereignty rather than having it in the cloud you can actually bring it out and, and sit next to the cloud with us and we'll store that for you and we'll guarantee where it is so so there's a lot of these things that when you're working alongside the big cloud providers um uh, you know you the network needs to be there it needs to be private it needs to be secure but sometimes the the regulations around it and the data sovereignty around it are just as important. So it's always worth talking to, to BSO about that, about how we can actually help you shift your data around the world um, and get it to where it needs to be safely and securely. And again, it all comes back down to the client experience. It gives them the best um, service in the market, whether it's for their internal use or whether they sell that onto their clients, um, it gives them the best outcome. So uh, that's what we're all about. Yeah, great. Thank you. It's a very good point about data sovereignty. And, and thanks for actually picking up that question on how to ensure data sovereignty uh, with complex networks architecture. So I will, um, we have come up to uh, the half hour and I will go around the room and ask you for your final pieces of advice. But before we do that, I do want to let in some questions that I see have come in from the audience. So um, one question is, how do you drive DevOps when you have legacy infrastructure? What processes should be followed? Does anyone want to pick that one up? There's a, there's a stunned silence from the room on a question about DevOps. I mean, it, uh, look, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have a stab at it. I mean, um, DevOps for, for banks, financial services, generally you have to run it on the same infrastructure that you have your live services on because it's all well and good having a live service that you prove to the regulators works and is secure, etc. And then you're doing all your DevOps on something completely different. So um, whether you are migrating those to the cloud or running them in-house, they, they need to be um, the same. So you have to build everything twice, at least, and probably multiple times because you're probably deploying in London, Tokyo, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, et cetera. So you're deploying the same thing over and over again. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, your DevOps um, needs to be um, on the same type of infrastructure, but it needs to be completely separate and secure away from it so that you can do all your testing um, if, if those of you with long memories might remember a company called Night Securities um, back in the States who uh, released a, a, an algo trading application that had a bug in it. And from memory, I think they went bust within about five to 10 minutes, literally because it traded against itself. So, you know, and I, I'm not joking about it. This, this was very serious back in a long time ago. Um, and, you know, I think it's very important that people do have very strong sandboxed um, DevOps uh, places where they can run these types of um, services. And again, to do that, you need historical uh, market data to test it against. 
So again, it's more and more and more data that you need to access and, and secure. Yeah, great, thank you. I see another question that's come in is, in what way does peering enhance an organization's connectivity, latency and speed? Um, Happy to take that one. Yeah. Um, so uh, in what way does peering, sorry, I can't see the question there, uh, enhance the speed and connectivity? Yes. So from uh, a BGP standpoint, using BGP essentially is the protocol that's used on a peering lab. Um, so with that, you're able to reduce the hops within the network. Uh, traditionally on a, a transit network, you might have hops that's um, uh, 10, 12, 14 hops away from the end network that you're looking to reach. Uh, with peering, because you're reaching them at the peering LAN, um, let's take London 1 as an example, our primary peering LAN in London, um, you're able to go across to whichever to a b or c network within two to three hops because you're reaching them essentially across the exchange directly using bgp um, so that enhances uh, the connectivity it reduces latency and obviously you have a, an improved routing protocol on your your network yeah great explanation there i see why you're appearing advisor <laughs> clearly <laughs> the it's not the first time you're explaining that uh, there's another question there about uh, interconnected London. I think that Patrick, you talked about this concept of interconnected London. So the question is, uh, could you please explain what interconnected London means? So interconnected London essentially is is um, a sense of action digital realty handling uh, metro connectivity between all between our data centers. So effectively, let's say if you've got uh, an application deployed in a, in a Docklands data center uh, and you want to um, access some of our Hanbury Street financial services community, uh, the customer experience will be, you know, it will be similar to a local cross connect. So, which means that all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the aggregate of all our connectivity carrier commun community is available anywhere in, in our data centers across the city and Docklands. Uh, uh, it also means that all of the uh, on and off ramps that we have present, for instance, in the Docklands, you know, become automatically available via direct cross connect to our customers in Hanbury Street. So effectively you really get, uh, the full variety of, of the connectivity ecosystem available in each of the data centers, uh, which is which is a really exciting uh, uh, proposition we are able to give our our customers. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. And then the last question: um, What is the best way to start network optimization without disrupting the end customer's experience? And I guess that comes back to that redundancy and resilience that several of you talked about having several interconnection options. Does anyone want to address that question? Um, I'm, I'm happy just to pick that one up with a very short answer, which is speak to the experts that know how to do it. Um, you know, when you try and try and do everything yourselves, um, you know, you're not always getting the best advice and the best service. So, you know, you've got people on this um, panel and companies on this panel that are experts in doing these kind of projects so speak to us and, uh, and and take some advice there's also a whole raft of consultancy companies and others out there that um will will help you as well but i would absolutely suggest getting external advice um and not trying to do everything in-house for these things sure so just to add to that um to in terms of uh, network optimization, um, without disturbing the end customer experience, it, it's a challenge that we always face with companies that's newly come into the peering world. Um, so they come to us if they haven't peered elsewhere before. Um, that's the number one concern for them, um, that they want to keep 100% uptime in, in services, right? But uh, if you're having mission critical applications that are being hosted, um, as part of your service, that, that is really critical for the business. So what we always advise is they take, let's say, a, a smaller connection, what they would have. If, if they have 100 gig on transit, take one gig as a peering port, connect to a single network or one or two networks that you have a decent amount of traffic to and start to build up that traffic profile um, using BGP. Get comfortable with the protocols of using BGP. Once you're able to do that and you're able to see the benefits, and test 
the, the waters with it, essentially. Um, then we, adv we advise, um, loosely, shall we say, um, that uh, they, they, should, they start to move their traffic anyway from transits to peering, um, based on some of our advice that, that is given, um, because transit can be much more costly at that point. But also they have a reliance and they're reassured of the service that they're using at, at that stage. Um, so then we start to see a higher migration level starting from one particular network um, to going to almost a 50-50 split in network traffic being used across peering. Um, so it's it, it's a, a trial trial and error um, almost, but um, it's just dipping their toes in. There are some networks that join um, uh, links or any other peering exchange around the world and fully utilize the port from day one. Um, it's purely based on how comfortable they are using the peering protocols really. Um, and as I said, others that join the exchange and slowly migrate their traffic across over six months to a year, um, it's completely based on how comfortable they are. Um, but as Matthew pointed out, it's definitely good to uh, always get um, um, some external advice on this. And uh, we're always happy to help as experts in the field. I think just to add to that, with the question around network optimization, I think a lot, a lot of customers have, have been forced into network optimization overnight with the current climate. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned from people like Lynx uh, and people like BSO um, who have experienced this a lot more in the telco world and have gone through the network optimization at a higher level. So I think within this call, reiterating what Matthew said, there is a lot of knowledge about network optimization and network development and network transformation and, and how to get the best out of that. Um, so do, I do encourage people to, to engage us on that and test us out on that. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and then I see. So we've also had a question through about um, from one of the uh, attendees asking about do we see the main banks taking internet or direct connectivity? Yeah, I can read out the question. So, okay. uh, in cloud adoption within the financial services industry, do you see them adopting this through direct connectivity or internet? So of course, both can have their added security on top of which do you see more of? Do you, do you mind if I pick yeah. that up? So, so I, just, I just saw that one come in. I didn't know if you'd, if you'd seen it. Um, so uh, yeah, I think um, we, we definitely see more people having direct connectivity. Um, I think just there, there are places to use the internet, um, but for some of the large scale, particularly back office systems and anything to do with trading, um, it's all going uh, direct connect. Clearly things like retail banking um, and, you know, you're banking at home and on your mobiles, that's a different thing. But um, the, the main back office systems and uh, trading applications we definitely see as, as direct connections. Just uh, latency or variable latencies don't work. Um, it has to be uh, a deterministic latency, uh, the security and the regulatory approvals as well. Um, uh, always point to direct connect for that, but others may have have other views around different types of banking apps for sure. Yeah, Patrick. Uh, so, yeah, just to add, I think um, my interpretation a little bit is if you're on hybrid mode, if if you've got to, um, if you've got an application running in the cloud and you need to connect back into on-prem or, or vice versa, then definitely we see within financial services direct connectivity be, being being the norm and I think uh, as Matthew says you need to have uh, deterministic in terms of latency uh, minimize the number of hops as well um, and more and more these online applications are becoming more and more critical so user experiences of, of the essence and therefore you really need to secure your connectivity and Actually, nowadays, it's becoming more and more um, easier to do. If you adopt collocation, you can cross-connect directly, or you can use one of the solutions offered by, by BSO, for instance, or, or links to connect uh, directly up to the, um, to the various um, uh, CSPs. I think just to, just to, just to almost um, conclude on that direct connect question, from, from personal experience, having, having serviced a broad range of um, customer types, the direct connect piece was almost um, in some cases forgotten or it was the last consideration. I think in the financial world, it's got to be one of the first. Um, and I think, so I think we will, 
we will see that and we will need to involve that in, in conversations much more than maybe some other industry sectors. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, so we are coming up to the end of our session, but before I let our expert panel uh, go, I'm going to ask you all to uh, leave us in the audience with uh, one piece of advice for any uh, financial services organization that is has started on or in the middle of this uh, transformation journey. Um, if you could leave the audience with one piece of advice each, and I will start with you, Halil. Sure. Um, so my piece of advice um, would be capacity planning. Um, the last year or 18 months has shown how important this is and how crucial it is for a business to get this right. Um, so capacity planning was thrown out the window as soon as the, the pandemic started um, last year. Um, we were having upgrades of seeing around about 30% on average, really, from certain networks across the board um, on, on the exchange. So it's a high level of traffic increase to have within such a short period of time, right? And everyone is dependent on us as uh, a key part of the network infrastructure within the UK, but also the networks are also um, very much have a, a requirement to their customers and they need to service that. So instead of networks traditionally looking at 18 months to two years for capacity planning, I would urge them to do a, a viewpoint of potentially three years and also doing a best and worst case scenario of capacity increases. So whether that's, if they traditionally saw, let's say a 10% increase, they should look at 20 and 30% and have central supply lines linked to that, should that occur. Um, because of such exponential in increases that have happened at the start of the pandemic in March, we were having people call us left, right, and center asking for bandwidth increases that if they're connected to link, sure, not a problem. We can increase that fairly quickly. Um, but if you're not um, getting connected, et cetera, is, is quite um, lengthier than just turning up a port. So I, I would encourage them to make uh, best and worst case projections rather than just having a standard projection for what they would normally do uh, within a, a non-pandemic year, if you like. Um, but that, that would be my, my piece of advice. Yeah, great advice. I think, again, this year has taught us that to prepare for the unpredictable, right? Not just for business as usual. Patrick, Definitely. what is your piece of advice? Well, my piece of advice is, is going to be to, you know, try and help um, uh, the piece of advice of Halil, really. So if, if you need to sort of do forecast predicting of traffic, you, you probably also need to have a better understanding of the, the data um, profiles of your applications, uh, their behavior. Um, so I, I would say that involves at an organization level, you know, NetOps talking a lot more to, to DevOps and the business. And it also uh, involves, I think, thinking a little bit more, as I mentioned earlier on about data gravity. So look at your applications, your data assets in terms of the mass, you know, the, uh, the activity of the data, the latency and bandwidth involved, um, and then have that ongoing dialogue between, um, you know, the application development and and the network architects. Uh, I think that's that's going to be crucial, especially when you start to branch into new uh, domains like AI, deep learning, blockchain, etc., which which are completely new for for the whole industry. Yeah, also a great piece of advice. I'll steal a quote from another uh, interesting conversation I had last year. Uh, and the quote was to predict the present. So you have to start by predicting the present. And that's what you're talking about, understanding where you, you're at, what your data profiles look like, what your needs are in order to then actually do the capacity planning. Yeah, great. So Matthew, you will have the final and, and not, not the most important, but the, yet the final piece of advice to share with the audience. It's, you know, it's what I said earlier and that's, you know, talk, talk to experts that have done this with other clients and other businesses. Um, you know, the, the people on this panel, you know, links Interaction, BSO, we, we, we're working with clients on this day in, day out. So, you know, if you need some advice, talk to us. Um, you won't be the first person doing this, that's for sure. Um, we've got a lot of experience of doing and managing these types of projects and programs. So, so talk to us and, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll help where we can um, to make your programs a success. 
Wonderful, thank you. There's a lot of experience uh, within these three organizations indeed, so make the most of it. So that brings us to the end of our session. So thank you so much to our panelists for that very insightful session. Thank you, Halil, Matthew and Patrick. And thanks, of course, to everyone who tuned in today uh, for joining us today. I hope you all find it at, as interesting as I did. Please do reach out to our teams for more advice and assistance when it comes to secure and agile networking. This session will also be available on YouTube on our respective uh, channels and websites shortly. So watch this space and we hope to see you soon again from all of us here at Links Interaction and BSO. All the best. Thank you and goodbye.